Hey guys, straight from the emergency room where I've been for the last nine hours because I fractured my foot and have awesome shiny new crutches. We're going to talk about Yashihime. And then I'm going to bed. Hi guys, my name is Maria Park and this is Approach to Nerd. And in this episode, we are reviewing Yashihime Princess Half Demon entitled Meifuku the Mayoju, and this is episode nine. Um, this episode was very fast paced. I'm not going to go verbatim. I'm not going to recap the whole thing. I'm just going to talk about some key things and I'm going to talk about what I liked and some things that I noticed. But yeah, it was a very fast paced episode. It's actually a lot more fast paced than I'm kind of used to with the series. But what I think happened there is I kind of feel like the reason it was so fast paced is because we didn't get a ton of new characters. Like, you know, in the last episode, we got to see, you know, um, some flashback scenes with the OG cast, with the girl streaming, and we got to, you know, we had two perils, or we had a peril and the minion, and we had, you know, Riku, you know, we got to see the shenanigans he was into, and, you know, it's just, we had all of the stuff that we could, you know, be distracted by, but this one, we only had a few characters, and so it was interesting, but it was extremely, like, I feel like once they start, started getting to the, the, the whole point and meat of the story it just went really freaking fast so not a bad not a bad episode but just a very fast paced episode so basically um in this episode we're introduced with to another one of karimaru's um perils named kantan and he is narcissistic as hell he like takes out an entire fortress because it was blocking the scenery that he thought was beautiful. Um, so yeah, he's one of those types. <laughs> so um, the girls basically get offered a job by Jubei to hunt Kantan down. And Moroha's like, yes, you know, it's 1,000 mon. That's a year's worth of supply of rice. Yay. But Toa is immediately like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't really care about demon, you know, bounty hunting. And Satsuna's is like, demon hunting and bounty hunting are not the same thing. And Moroha gets really upset. And she's like, you know what? You guys, you're just dummies. And your mother was human. And I'm like, that's probably not the best insult from someone who's a quarter human and whose mother was also human to be yelling at someone else. But, you know, I don't think she learned how to bitch, uh, oh, or bitch smack or play fight with people yet. So that's probably the best insult she's got. So she takes off with um, Takechiyo, and this is where we start really seeing just how lonely Moroha is. She's like, I finally thought I had friends, you know, and, my, and I have these cousins that I was going to bond with, and I wouldn't be alone. Like, I've been alone for all this time, and I'm like, wow. But it does beg the question, who took care of her? Because being alone and saying that you've been alone all this time still doesn't tell you how you survived as an infant. Hachi flew off with you, but who did he leave you with or who took care of you when you were not able to take care of yourself? So that's that's something I thought was interesting. Um, then there was the whole shift, I guess, in attitude. So like Toa immediately goes to Jubei and is like, did you find any information on the dream butterfly? And he's like, negative. <laughs> but then he's like, but you know what you could do? You could actually put a bounty out on this dream butterfly and somebody would want that money or that bounty and would 100% go and find that dream butterfly. And that, at that moment, I already knew that Jubei knew where that, but, that dream butterfly was. But he's manipulative. So, because Moroha couldn't get them to go based on the, their friendship and their bond. But he convinced Toa to put a bounty out on this dream butterfly and it, it would cost the exact same 1,000 mon than, um, than the job that Moroha's doing that they just turned down. So, of course, Toa does a 180 and her Setsuna, even though Setsuna's kind of like, I don't really want to be involved in this. I don't give a damn about this dream butterfly. I don't give a damn about my dreams. I don't care about memories. I don't care about any of it. But, you know, because Toa wants to do it, Setsuna's like... We're going to do it. So they ride the bike and they're following um, Moroha and uh, Takechiyo and they're, you know, talking. They're basically buttering up Moroha, which is very sad. It's actually very sad because I do think that Moroha is just a very lonely girl. Um, but they all decide to go take Kantan's head. And so they go to um, basically confront him. And I love how when they first see him, Toa's like, excuse me, um, did you destroy that fortress? <laughs> and he's like, nope. 
I didn't destroy it. I removed it because it was an eyesore, basically. Couldn't see the beautiful scenery around me. I did this environment a favor. <laughs> I was like, but it's like a whole in- exchange is like, what the hell? And of course, Moreau was like, yeah, it's definitely him. Um, but which another thing that I really liked about Kantan is how sensitive he is about having a bounty put on his head. Because when we were like, oh, yeah, you know, there's a bounty for 1,000 mon. He's like, that is disgusting and despicable. And I, he loved to say that. That's, he's such a narcissist. Um, but his character is very interesting. We learned um, that he's able to use um, both Tao and Fang magic, and that most perils probably can because, according to Mayoga, who just shows up randomly to give them this Google search information, feudal style, by saying, "Oh yeah, the perils are all from the mainland, and they can use Tao, and they can use you know Fang magic," and I'm like, literally, that that that's why you're here. <laughs> you know, you're just literally here. As the Google, he's basically Alexa. <laughs> like so, whatever. Do you Mio or Mioga Grandpa? But yeah, so um, they take on Kantan, but they're getting their A's handed to them because he's got all this magic, and you know he's got this formidable, impenetrable armor that's made out of the shell of a demon, and the demon it actually happens to be. Um, Meifuku, who is a little turtle demon they meet, um, father, Meiju, or Meiju, he um, basically took on Kantan, and Kantan did a mobilization um, spell and was able to slay um, Meifuku's father and take his shell, and it's actually his shell that he's wearing that is, you know, basically impossible to pierce. You can't steal any demon energy from it because basically there is no demon energy. So the girls didn't really do very well in the very first battle with him, um, and Toa wasn't even able to drain him. Um, so they, instead of running, he actually uses one of his, you know, <laughs> I'm going to call it like, it's, it's interesting. It's like they're different spells. So like it's one of his like dark cloud spells, a whisk them away. But then he sends these two like very cool looking tiger demons after them or lion demons, sorry, lion demons after them. And one's called wind and one is called um, thunder. And if you've ever seen the movie, The Storm Riders, it's based off of a Chinese comic book that has two, you know, TV dramas with the same name. It's very, very cool. It starred Aaron Kwok and Ekin Chen back in the day, back in the 90s. Um, Those two lions remind me of Wind and Cloud, the Lee characters in that movie series, in the TV series. So just throwing it out there. If you've not seen The Storm Riders, check it out. It's actually very, very cool. But yeah, as soon as I saw them, I saw Wind and Thunder, I'm like, wind and cloud um <laughs> but yeah they were pretty much conjured too by the magic so they aren't real either but you know they're pretty formidable for a while um so basically we learned that you know Meifuku has been following Kantan around for like 10 years but he hasn't been able to confront him because he's only 50 years old um and that he needs to grow another 50 to get where his father was in terms of how hard and powerful his shell was and you know moroha's like at first she tries to pull it off she's like well if you're not gonna do it then i'll do it and, and she can't get the shell off so then she's like well you just need to you know guard me or protect me and he's like okay then he flies on the toa because he's like moroha scares me <laughs> I mean, that whole scene is just hilarious. There's a lot of little comedy moments in here. But again, we don't get a lot of exposition or any clues as to the past and what's happening currently simultaneously in this plot. Um, But long story short, um, the girls are able to work with um, Mifuku and his father, who's the, I guess the spirit is talking through the shell. Um, and directs his son on how to attack. And I forgot the name of the attack. I'm sorry, guys. I, I literally have been in that ER <laughs> since like uh, probably 1.30 a.m. my time. I left at 10 a.m. And I have not been asleep since Thursday, and this is Saturday. So I'm doing my best, but I cannot remember his attack. But um, he is, his father convinces him to use it, and it's able to do some damage. And then Toa was able to do damage. And of course, Satsuna and um, Moroha use, you know, she uses her Cyclone attack, and Moroha uses her Crimson Dragon attack, and they're able to, you know, um, basically weaken Kanan, and they're able to get the shell away from him, which, of course, Mifuku is going to be able to take back to his father's bones, which are under this lake. Um, but 
Kantan escapes. So Kantan is out there um, recharging his magical batteries, pissed as hell. And of course, um, you know, Moroha and Co. did not get the head, so they're not going to get paid. So um, it was an interesting episode. It really was. Um, it's just, again, the only thing I took from this episode, honestly, is that Moroha was always alone. Like she was always alone. And then she's like, she was so excited to finally have her cousins there and she's bonding and she finally has friends. And it was really sad. So I was, I guess it kind of upset me that Toa and Setsuna were only in it for the money, really, to, to be able to do the bounty. More Toa's idea than Setsuna because Setsuna doesn't give a damn. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of bothered me a little bit, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm still trying to figure out after last week's episode, um, what is Takachio's role? Like, what is her, what is his story? Because they make it feel like, and they, they actually, I think they call him young Lord too. That it's, it seems like something happened and either he doesn't remember it, which he probably doesn't. He's probably affected the same way, which is why I think Jubei knows a lot about what's going on, a lot about that damn dream butterfly. Um, but I want to know how, if that was Hachi, you know, masquerading as Moroku, why? And why Taketio? Like, what is he? Why is he important? So there's just so much. There's so much. And next episode, um, when the twins get possessed and have to fight each other i think we're going to learn a lot more about what's going on in the past too so i am excited for next week but yeah this was kind of like if i had to call something a filler episode i would call this one a filler episode because it was fast paced it was nice it was cute but it didn't really do much to forward the plot so but yeah that is my opinion i would love to know what you guys think so please guys leave me a comment below and let me know and if you would like to set up for jury duty, hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to know who's next on the nerd bell, hit the notification bell. Until next time, I can't wait for you to approach the nerd. Bye, guys. Thank you for watching my video. I really appreciate it. But hey, the party doesn't have to stop now. Click on one of these videos and keep it going.